Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our program today, Left Behind Afghan Special Forces, Women and Vulnerable Groups. The purpose of today's conversation is to highlight that the disaster that we saw in Afghanistan was not a single moment in August of 2021, but is an ongoing moral and security failing that requires significant attention and resolution. We're now nine months after the US departure from Afghanistan, and yet we continue to see those who put their lives on the line in support of Afghan democracy be hunted down and killed by Taliban fighters. But there are some stories that inspire hope. After witnessing the United States abandon our values and interests, everyday men and women from around the world refuse to do the same. They stepped up to fill the gap, and today we will hear their stories of evacuating and rescuing folks on the ground and discuss their recommendations for what we can do now to mitigate the threats being posed not only to these vulnerable populations still in Afghanistan, but also to broader American national security. So for those of you who are not familiar, my name is Carrie Filippetti, and I'm the executive director of the Vandenberg Coalition. The Vandenberg Coalition exists as a network of scholars and practitioners who recognize that American security and prosperity depends on strong and principled American leadership, and who seek to educate the public and policymakers on solutions to today's most pressing national security challenges. Among those, of course, is Afghanistan. In the aftermath of our withdrawal from Afghanistan, our senior policy director, Dr. Amanda Rothschild, and our research associate, Sam Byers, brought together a panel of foreign policy experts and practitioners with diverse experience working on Afghanistan policy at all levels of government, in the military, and in country. Over the course of six months, that working group examined the decisions that led to the U.S. withdrawal and developed a set of policy recommendations as to how the U.S should address Afghanistan going forward from the perspective of counterterrorism, relations with the Taliban, evacuations, humanitarian assistance, and great power competition. You can find our report online. All of those recommendations relied on two key themes though. One, that the administration not forget the growing security threat in the region, and two, that the United States stand behind those who stood with us over the last two decades of fighting. These are our goals today, to keep attention on the crisis, and to provide insights into how we can do more to meet our moral responsibility to defend the men and women who have already sacrificed so much. In our discussion today, we will first hear from Ambassador Kelly Curry, who will set the scene for the current human rights and national security situation in Afghanistan. Next, we will hear from Representative Mike Waltz, Congressman from Florida's 6th District and a combat decorated Green Beret officer, who will share the implications of our withdrawal on American security and moral leadership. I do wanna note here that the Congressman does have a vote that was called for around this time. So it's possible that he comes at a slightly different moment, in which case we'll stop the rest of the session, go to him uh, and then continue after that. So please be mindful that we may have that uh, occur. The bulk of the discussion will then include a panel discussion with the men and women who put their lives and livelihoods on the line to defend and protect those vulnerable populations that have been left behind, including Amy Mitchell, Kathy Cruzan, Ilaha Eli Omar, General David Hicks, and Travis Peterson. While many of our leaders have focused elsewhere, the conflict in Afghanistan rages forward for the thousands of Afghan National Army Special Forces soldiers, many of whom risked their lives over the last two decades to serve alongside American Special Forces. You will hear how groups like the Moral Compass Federation and Operation Sacred Promise have been working day and night to safeguard and evacuate these soldiers who fall victim to Taliban violence every single day. You will also hear the inspiring work being done by Uplift Afghanistan to provide humanitarian assistance, refugee resettlement, and preservation of culture and art for the 35 million men and women who remain in Afghanistan, as well as from the Institute for the Economic Empowerment of Women, which has focused its efforts on the safeguarding of livelihoods, freedoms, and security for the women who, after decades-long promises of democracy, are now under militant Taliban rule. So I'm excited to begin our conversation with Ambassador Kelly Curry. Ambassador Curry served as a U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues and the U.S. Representative at the United States at the United Nations Commissions on the Status of Women. She also previously served as a U.S. Representative to the U.N. Economic and Social Council and has spent a career focused on human rights, political reform, and development issues. I will say that I've had the honor of working alongside Ambassador Curry, and the only thing that matches her mind on these issues is her heart. She spent the last few months dedicated to working with the organizations we're speaking to today to protect our Afghan partners. So Ambassador Curry, we're honored to have you. Now that we're about nine months after the U.S. withdrawal, what does the human rights and security landscape still look like for those left behind? 
Thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you so much to the Vandenberg Coalition for organizing this event and bringing together this inspiring group of Americans who have come together to basically fill the gap that the United States government has left in, in the wake of the collapse of the Afghan government and the fall of Kabul in August. I can't think of a group of people I'm more, I would be more honored to be with today than the, the folks that I'm, I'm sharing this, this video um, call with. They are truly, they inspire me and their, their dedication and their commitment and their perseverance on these things has just been an amazing thing. And it's it's shown the best of America. And I'm so, so proud to be with them today. And I, I've really um, learned so much from working alongside and, and around these, these folks, as well as with our colleagues at the Vandenberg Coalition that we worked with on the report. And I would encourage everyone who hasn't done so to um, seek out that report on the Vandenberg Coalition's website about Afghanistan, I think that it's still quite relevant um, because as, as Carrie, Carrie outlined the main um, kind of thrust of it, but I think that what was very clear in that report and what continues to be clear more than uh, or nearly nine months after the fall of Kabul is that the Biden administration still has no strategy for Afghanistan. And this is just it, it, in a way it's, it's absolutely stunning. They went into the, the um, the the evacuation without a clear strategy and nine months later nearly nine months later it they still don't have an afghan strategy that is in any way coherent or recognizable as such and for those of us who've been working on these issues it's deeply frustrating to try to engage and try to work and try to to work toward a better future for afghanistan um, in a in a consistent and strategic way when our own government has no clear, definable, identifiable strategy. So that that is really the biggest, I would say, challenge that we all face at the macro level right now. Um, if you look at, at kind of some of the indicators of this, you can see, and, and I, these, I, these folks will talk about this in more detail, but evacuations of our allies have slowed to a trickle and have been beset by the most insane Kafka-esque bureaucratic nightmare that I've ever seen. And I've been working in and around the US government for nearly three decades, and I've never seen anything quite like this. It's, it's incredibly ad hoc. Most of it is, you know, makes no sense. It's you see one group of people who are similarly situated to another given completely disparate treatment for no apparent reason other than bureaucratic, um, without actually even a bureaucratic explanation, just just kind of bizarre, idiosyncratic and and constantly shifting landscape as we try to navigate. And we've all had to become experts on refugee law. We've all had to become experts on refugee administrative processes. We've all had to become experts on logistics, on transportation, on visas, on a whole host of issues that um, we've all had to learn on, as we've go, gone along and the rules keep keep changing and shifting as we go and the processes keep morphing and changing and the paperwork keeps changing. It's been so frustrating, but I, you know, I, my colleagues can attest to this with much more um, <laughs> color and much more specificity than I can. In Afghanistan, obviously the economy remains in a shambles. The Taliban does not know how to govern, so they aren't governing um, except through coercion and force and violence and terror. Um, the extremist groups that are resurgent and continuing to expand their territory, continuing to attack civilian populations, focusing on the most vulnerable groups, such as Shia minorities, um, schools, and extremely soft targets, as they are want to do. And the Taliban is doing very little or nothing to defend the civilian population from other extremist groups. I'm not even going to say extremist groups because the Taliban is itself also um, just, you know, it, we all know it's a medieval death cult and it's, a, it's an, an extremist group itself. So uh, it's not like they, they are ideologically divorced from these, these horrible, these other groups, ISIS, Khorasan and others that are terrorizing the civilian population, but they're certainly doing nothing to, to stop it. Um, 
meanwhile, and they've, you know, in addition to failing to live up to, to their commitments uh, there, they've, they've basically failed to live up on to any other commitment that they've made um, since taking power. As we all know, girls over the sixth grade are still not in school. They um, backed out of a promise to resume schooling for um, girls over, over primary education level in March and with no explanation um, and, the, and the world has done absolutely nothing to hold them to this and there have been no consequences for them. They continue to get um, sanctions relief either through humanitarian exemptions or through kind of a slide toward recognition, soft recognition by governments. Again, because they don't have any affirmative policy to do anything, they're just kind of drifting the United States, the Europeans, other, other countries in the region are just drifting toward a sort of soft de facto recognition of the Taliban that has allowed them to set the terms of the negotiations with the international community and the, the UN has utterly failed in its mandate to try to to resolve this situation. And um, we have seen some, some a, sm a few small glimmers where we now have um, a new uh, evidence mechanism and, and a new human rights repertoire, but the UN struggles to staff UNAMA. They've struggled with, um, with even allowing their women, the women on the UN staff to fully participate in activities. Meanwhile, humanitarian organizations are cutting their own deals with the Taliban. And so we've seen aid diversion off the chart as usual. Again, nothing new here, but you basically are seeing a return to some of the worst aspects of what was going on in Afghanistan prior to 9-11 in the late 90s, where the Taliban was in power the last time and the UN just cut, UN agencies just cut their own deals and everybody kind of did what they wanted um, as long as they were able to negotiate with the Taliban and the Taliban has not been held to account for anything. Overall, women continue to be, of course, the most victimized in this situation and face huge and growing barriers and economic and social participation. They've basically been stripped of all their rights by the Taliban and they've reverted back to form. Um, this is, everybody talked about, oh, this is the new Taliban. They're more tolerant. They're more, um, they'll let girls go to school. We've seen that that's not been the case. They are who we thought they were in the words of Dennis Green and they haven't really changed fundamentally. So I think that we've also seen, and again, my colleagues can speak to this reprisal killing um, off the charts still, um, it, despite promises for amnesties, um, corruption that has come back with a vengeance because of the inability to govern the country. They don't, they literally cannot govern. They don't know how, and they're not really willing to even try. Um, the, and, and civil servants aren't being paid. So even basic functions, you only can get anything done if you can pay civil servants yourself to do basic jobs. Um, and so the even as the threats remain and grow, um, and Afghanistan is not going to stop being a threat to the United States or the region, um, the administration just continues with this ad hoc drift policy that is, is really um, puts, puts us all in danger and, and and, Afghan and Afghanistan just continues to move toward failed state status. So with that, um, I, I don't see Congressman Waltz joining us yet. So I think we might want to carry, um, I'm going to turn it back to you to, to move us to the, discuss the, 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 the panel discussion. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So once again, the representative is going to join us um, after uh, his, his voting period. So it may be kind of randomly throughout this session, really appreciate people's patience, but I'm happy to jump into the meat of the conversation as we await for our keynote speaker. Um, so we're now turning to a panel discussion, uh, which is moderated by Amy Mitchell. I'll do a quick introduction of Amy and then turn it over to her. I also want to mention that during this session, there will be an opportunity for audience Q&A. So please do feel free to use the Q&A portion of the Zoom webinar um, to ask any questions that you'd like um, to either all of the panelists or a specific panelist. Um, so, uh, Amy Mitchell, uh, we're very honored to have her here today. Amy has served in a number of critical national security roles. 
Um, she has most recently served as the Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor for the Office of Global Women's Issues. Um, she, in her work in government, she has won the, uh, the Distinguished Public Service Medal. Um, however, it is uh, her work most recently outside of government that deserves true recognition. Um, so Amy, alongside Ambassador Curry, has worked closely with numerous nonprofit organizations over the last year to step in when the United States withdrew from Afghanistan, providing logistical and operational support to those who are on the ground evacuating partners and vulnerable Afghans. Since the withdrawal, she has continued this work raising awareness of the threats posed by the Taliban against these populations. And in that work, Amy has partnered with the Moral Compass Federation, the Institute for the Economic Empowerment of Women, Uplift Afghanistan, and Operation Sacred Promise, all of whom are represented here today. Um, so Amy will guide us through a conversation with these men and women who have dedicated their lives and livelihoods to protecting and defending those left behind. So thanks very much, Amy. Carrie, thanks so much. and. Um... And for that kind introduction and our thanks to Ambassador Curry, who uh, literally was up with us straight for those two weeks in August, um, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, texting, trying to trying to get people through that airport. So I want to focus on um, the, the true heroes here, Kathy, Travis, Dave and and Ellie who have just been relentless in, in trying to evacuate the, those that um, we stood alongside or stood alongside us, I should say, for the last 20 years. And also working with them to find ways that they can um, work or get an education or just make it through what we're seeing in Afghanistan with the worst famine uh, in decades, global famine in decades. So um, I'm going to start with uh, Brigadier General Dave Hicks, who served multiple tours in Afghanistan, uh, training the Afghan Air Force, and has uh, again been working the evacuation um, since the evacuation, including to rescue Afghan pilots from Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, and is still working those cases today. Uh, General Hicks, will you please uh, just give us a couple uh, minutes and we might need to break. I just got to note that uh, the congressman might be joining us in about two minutes, depending on votes. So I'll keep everyone posted. But General Hicks, please. Okay, great. Uh, it's awesome to have a chance to chat today and, and meet everyone here. Um, you know, quick background on me uh, 2016 to 2017, I was in command of all the US and NATO forces uh, in Afghanistan building the Afghan Air Force. So living with them, flying with them, uh, flying with them, uh, like I said, pretty much every type of aircraft and helicopter they had. So, you know, obviously built uh, a lot of great and close relationships uh, over that time. Um, as this led up to the, to the fall of Kabul uh, in the middle of August, around August 15th, uh, we started getting a ton of pilots uh, reaching out to the, their current advisors and former advisors here in the U.S. asking how they were going to uh, how they were going to get out, or is there a plan uh, to help uh, help them get out? We rapidly figured out there wasn't, and the only way that uh, we had a chance or we're going to have a chance of getting uh, them and their families to safety uh, was us taking it on our own uh, and doing it. And so initially I started with just A29s and the group of uh, advisors that were working with them, and then eventually morphed into all of the Afghan Air Force uh, over the last eight months trying to get them out. Uh, happy to say a little bit of good news today. We got the last of our pilots that were uh, in Tajikistan out of the UAE, and they landed in uh, Virginia this morning. So uh, we've actually gotten about a thousand uh, pilots, Air Force members, and their families out uh, to date. Sure, thank you. That's a huge credit. And over, Kerry, to Congressman Waltz. Sure, yes, we have the Congressman here. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. I'll do a very quick introduction of you um, and then we'll pass it over to you. Um, as many of you know, uh, Congressman Waltz represents Florida's sixth congressional district, but his role as a Congressman is really only his most recent foray into public service. He spent 24 years in the US Army during which time he served as a Green Beret with multiple combat tours in Afghanistan, the Middle East and Africa. Uh, he continues to serve as a colonel in the U.S. National Guard, um, and he previously held positions in the White House and the Pentagon, uh, as well as at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, one of Vandenberg Coalition's strongest partners. So I want to make sure I include that as well. 
Um, as you can all see, the common thread behind the Congressman's work has been his lifelong commitment to public service. So Congressman, it is our honor and pleasure to hear your perspectives on Afghanistan as both a lawmaker and as someone who served on the ground there. Yeah, hey, thanks so much. And, and sorry for the timing here, but I'll, I'll blame the speaker. Uh, and I only, uh, I only have about two minutes uh, before I have to go vote. Uh, so I wish I could be with you longer and I'll just dive right in. Look, um, uh, as long as I am in Congress, as long as I am in this position, uh, I'm not gonna let this go, period. Uh, it, it's not only uh, extracting those that uh, we still have a moral duty uh, to get out, but it's the future counterterrorism fight that sadly we're gonna be dealing with future Gold Star families of Intel officers, special operators, you name it, that are gonna to have to go back to deal with this problem. Uh, I'm sadly convinced that, that we will have to do that. So it's that the, the fiction that is uh, over the horizon with how that's been um, portrayed, uh, it's the extraction piece, it's the reintegration piece, uh, all of those things, um, uh, believe me, I'm, I'm laser focused on and not going to let go. Uh, just to give a quick update of what I see coming, you know, the nice thing about being on armed services is we have a piece of legislation that has passed for the last 61 years. Uh, a couple of initiatives that we have ongoing, one is pressing State Department as a matter of policy to award um, former uh, uh, Afghan Army soft P1, P2 status so that they at least have some type of status. It's not perfect. Uh, we are trying to get SIV expanded, uh, but that, that comes with, it gets complicated in terms of it comes with mandatory funding, then find, you know, paying the bills for that uh, or finding offsets for that. But at a minimum, to get P1, P2, and then another piece I'm going to introduce into the, the defense bill is for those pilots that we were just talking about that are now in the United States or any um, uh, member of the Afghan armed forces that served in the Afghan military and now desires to continue serving in the American military to create a pathway to do that, but also then to accelerate a pathway to citizenship for them should they decide to serve again. Uh, and if you buy into the notion that at some point uh, we are going to have to go back to deal with the terrorists that didn't get the memo that the war is over, uh, wouldn't it be great to have these already trained Afghan operators, whether they be interpreters, former members of the special forces, pilots with the appropriate pilot training, and to have those skill sets to be able to call upon if we, sadly, we have to go back and, and, and deal with what is now a terrorist super state. Um, and there are other things that we're working on uh, in terms of the UN's slippery slope towards recognizing the Taliban. Uh, we're seeing that now with the Russians. We're seeing it with the Chinese. There's pressure from the Pakistanis within the UN uh, taking care of the Afghan diplomats that were that are just basically kicked out of their embassy uh, and, and taking care of them. Uh, I mean, there, there, there is a list of things uh, that it is, it is on our list to do, but is the morally right thing to do. And uh, again, we're going to stay on top of it. You guys feel free um, to, to call on me, to call on our office. Uh, they know this is my crusade uh, as, long as, as long as I'm here. Great. Thank I you. think with that, I think with that, I have to go run back and vote, but I just wanted to dive in and, and give you a quick update of things that I hope to get into this NDA. And by the way, from the last bill that we passed, uh, the Defense Department still owes us their over the horizon counterterrorism strategy. So look, I know we're focused on the now and we should be both on extraction and on reintegration, but I'm also uh, trying to do the right things to look over the horizon. Uh, on, on what's next. And to that end, uh, both Senator Graham and I have had multiple conversations with Masood, with Saleh, with others who stand with our values and don't stand with the Taliban. And I'll just leave that at that. Great. Thank you so much, Representative. We really appreciate your, your joining us. Good luck on the vote. Um, and thank you for your service, as well as for all the work that you're doing in support of okay. the people left behind. All right. God bless. Call me anytime. Thanks, Carrie. Great. Thank
Thank you. All right, turning it back over to you, Amy, to, uh, to continue with the panel. Well, we're getting great news from the Congressman about the um, legislation that Moral Compass Federation is very supportive to allow our Afghan um, veterans and military partners to enlist in the US military as a pathway to citizenship and also to give them a sustainable life here in the United States. So our, our extreme gratitude to the Congressman for that. And um, with that part, I wanna turn it to Travis for a brief introduction. Travis Peterson is a retired master sergeant in the Air Force. And when Kabul fell, Travis got on a cargo plane and went to HKF. He literally pulled, um, had hundreds, thousands uh, through the gates himself um, and is the head of Moral Compass Federation who has been advocating for these changes in policy to create sustainable pathways for our Afghan partners and to uh, keep us all on track in terms of those that are remain in Afghanistan as well as those are resettling here. So Travis, can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing today and, and anything that you want to tell us about what it was like in Ahtapaya back in August? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Amy and Carrie and Vandenberg, um, Ambassador. Um, thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity. <clears throat> um, a little bit background on myself, kind of like the general stated, um, retired military. I got tasked back in 2011, 2012 time frame right. to stand up a, the, the special mission wing, which focused on um, counter drug and counter terrorism operations. So um, I have a vested interest in all of my guys. I've been with them for a decade now. Um, after I retired, I went back as a contractor and continued all the way up until May. Um, and then the fall of Kabul happened. And we had already planned for it um, prior, you know, two months prior. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to get all the families out. So I flew back into Kabul to grab as many as I could. And I wish it was in the thousands, Amy, I really do. Um, but unfortunately, you know, I still have thousands and thousands left behind that I'm still trying to get. And that is why we built the Moral Compass Federation with 18 very specific organizations that are focused on our veteran brethren and their families, whether it be in Afghanistan or resettlement here in the United States. Travis, you're, you're very modest about what happened those days, but um, the work that you guys all did is just, it's, it's stunning to so many of us. Um, I wanted to, to turn over to the women. We have two great women with us today. Ellie Omar is the founder of Uplift Afghanistan and is also a member of the US Afghan Women's Council. She's worked in Afghanistan for more than a decade helping women and disabled children. Ellie, you stood up also during the evacuation and said, take me, um, worked relentlessly. Uh, both Ambassador Curry and I called on you many, many times for assistance. Um, but you've, you've now, uh, are working towards the future in Afghanistan. What does that look like to you through Uplift Afghanistan? So um, first of all, thank you for having me um, uh, join this panel today. And thank you for including an Afghan voice in this discussion. Um, I, am, I was born in Kabul and 40 days later, we fled the country in a very similar fashion to how Afghan people are fleeing the country today. Uh, because of the Soviet invasion. So the past nine months have been uh, exceptionally triggering for me. And um, I was actually in Kabul June and July of last year, um, launching a, helping launch a school for children with disabilities. Weeks later, I arrived back in San Francisco and I found myself with many of you uh, in the evacuation space, um, not really sleeping or eating, just trying to get people through those airport gates. And it was actually a very humiliating time for Afghan people and Afghan history, I have to say. And naturally, because of my connections and my colleagues and friends in Afghanistan, I fell in deep into the evacuation space, which I am still in today, but it's very uh, disappointing space to be in and very traumatic um, and feel very helpless at times, to be very honest. Um, 
I also, in the process, took a step back in the middle of EVEX about September to evaluate the economic collapse of the country because you had a few different crises unfolding all at the same time. A country that was 70 to 80% dependent on aid, which stopped overnight. The biggest employer of the country, the government, job stop overnight was going to be disastrous and is proven to be disastrous. Today, according to the UN, Afghanistan has the highest number of people in emergency food crisis. That's 23 million people. 95% of the country has insufficient food consumption. Those are huge numbers. But let me break it down to one little story for, that I heard today that a colleague of mine called me. She said, an Afghan woman called her today and said, not only do I, have, do I not have enough money for food, but I don't have enough money to buy poison. And that's the reality for Afghan people today. We're facing one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. And um, it's up to us, you know, we have to, we have to support, we have to help. This is why I set up Uplift Afghanistan Fund, because I knew that I had to create structure. Um, around this, we have OFAC challenges, we have sanctions, we have a, a, a run on the banks, a cash crisis, a banking collapse. I mean, there's a plethora of challenges that one has to get through to even get aid in the country. And this is a very unfortunate situation. And, um, you know, what we do at Uplift is we, we connect with grassroots organizations. We vet them, we support them, we let them lead. We let Afghan people make decisions for Afghanistan. Uh, but we support them on the back end. And so far we've, I've personally sent about four, $500,000 into the country successfully. We've gotten food to rural villages, uh, specifically targeting women, widowed, female-headed households. So it's doable, it's just, <laughs> Very difficult. Ellie, thank you. I mean, throughout all this, you've been our rock for so many of the women um, and, and finding solutions. And, and you give a good reminder that since August 15th, the, the choices that Afghans have had have been bad and worse. And, and you know, depending on US policies or the, the ongoing humanitarian crises, it's just been a continuous cycle that everyone in Afghanistan has faced. And, and we are just so grateful to Uplift and, and to your leadership for continuing to look for solutions and, and working on solutions uh, for the women there. Um, and, and now, uh, also a member of the US Afghan Women's Council, Kathy Krusen, who is the uh, chairwoman of the Institute for the Economic Empowerment of Women. Kathy has worked in conflict affected regions um, around the world, including in Afghanistan and Rwanda, and has also worked to help the women of Afghanistan. Kathy. Thanks, Amy. Difficult to follow um, all the panelists. So I'll start with a little bit about the organization. The organization was founded by Dr. Terry Neese and it was established to help women and business entrepreneurs in Afghanistan initially and then extended to Rwanda. I personally got involved with the organization as a volunteer mentoring women business uh, entrepreneurs in 2018. In 2018, 2019, I hosted women from Afghanistan and, and Rwanda in my home that were top of the class. So they, the organization offers the Peace Through Business program, which is a program that's the curriculum partner with Northwood University. And it's intended to help women in both countries uh, develop business skills and, and improve their businesses and stay in business together. I think between the two countries, about a thousand women have graduated the program resulting in about 16,000 jobs. Uh, the organization itself uh, is not gonna, 
not going to disappear from supporting women in Afghanistan. In fact, there were 21 women that were in the program this year participating in class virtually, of course, and many of them doing it from their homes and hiding, but continuing the efforts and continuing to try to keep their businesses going. Last uh, July 2015, the organization celebrated 15 years of impact in Afghanistan. It was within a couple of weeks of, of that celebration that, as we know, everything changed significantly in Afghanistan. At that time, I personally got involved in helping women that I'd met through the program uh, that had reached out that were trying to evacuate, many of them trying desperately to, to get out of the country. Some I can say have been successful, some are in, in other countries, but there are many more that have been left behind and others that have been separated from family. Many still trying to support themselves. The organization, the Institute for Economic Empowerment of Women also had to pivot and shift and was trying to help with evacuation efforts. It too has been trying to help with food, supplying food. I shifted in December and worked with an e-commerce Afghan a business to deploy baskets to women that had been in the program trying to get food to the families. And we're continuing a small effort to, to continue to get um, food to them. It's a real need that the, the need is so great there right now. There are women in multiple countries that are somewhat in transition. The ones that have been fortunate enough and lucky enough to evacuate are still separated and still in the state of limbo. Many who qualify for priority one and priority two status here in the United States and then just waiting on application approval and processing has been a challenge. Uh, you know, many other mentors in the, in the program, women business owners, they too were in contact and were supporting efforts. I have to tell you, it's been a grassroots citizen by citizen effort to help to help this. And Kelly, you and Amy have been tremendous in connecting individuals. Uh, I'm grateful to you. Uh, I, I wanted to help one Afghan female business owner. That's what, who I was trying to help. Those were my efforts in July and I'm still still working with that. You know, the organization, and we've had support from other countries, from Canada, there's been support from Rwanda, supporting hosting the, some of the women that we've been evacuating. The women business owners in both countries in the program are supporting one another too. And I think that's, it's been tremendous to see. Not, not enough, but it, it's encouraging, certainly encouraging, and it, it, it keeps me involved every day. Kathy, we're, we're grateful to you and, and your partner, John, who <laughs> saved, saved a lot of us during the evacuation um, and just stepped up like everyone else. Um, the theme that I'm hearing from everyone is not giving up. And, and that's key. You know, we, we've seen, um, as Ambassador Curry noted earlier, you know, a, a non-coherent, non-existent strategy um, from the administration, uh, Congress looking to fill in where they can, um, but from the group's you know perspectives, and not giving up. What do you see as the next steps, and you know what are the biggest challenges from what you're seeing, both with U.S. policy or your own specific groups that are you know either still trying to get out of Afghanistan, survive in Afghanistan. Um, you know, or the conditions just on the ground for, um, you know, members of the Afghan special forces or women and, and children. Um, what are the biggest challenges? What are the next steps? Uh, Kathy, do you want to start? Next steps is we, we can't stop. We can't abandon them. We have to continue our efforts to help. So many people are, are, are either have not been able to evacuate or are in some type of transition, either in temporary countries, uh, you know, the, the processing of their statuses and some transparency and navigating it. For those of us that are, are not involved in immigration, it's, it's, a very, it's a very technical and challenging world to navigate. And there's, there's not a lot of ability to, to verify and check on that and find out 
where a refugee is and not allowing them to get lost. I mean, they're, they're individual, single, there's families, there's entire families lost in transition. Some of them are, you know, I've got, I've got a group right now that one of them has had a baby. What is the status of that? That's a person between countries. There's so, the, the, the fallout and the, um, the future for so many individuals is just hanging open. They can't work. They can't, they don't know where they're going to live. We can't turn our backs. And I think those organizations, these nonprofit organizations, we have to continue our efforts and, and, and focus to help, to help this country and help these individuals. Absolutely. And, and one of the challenges, you know, we've talked about the bureaucracy of the U.S. refugee process. Um, another challenge is not being able to work. Uh, Travis and, and General Hicks, you, you two with Moral Compass and Operation Sacred Promise have been helping um, thousands of Afghan special forces, um, either through safe houses, food, heat, um, you know, what is next as, as they don't have a clear pathway to the United States right now, it's, you know, almost impossible for them to get over a border with the Taliban having them on these lists. Um, where do we go from here? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick and then Travis let you take it. Um, you know, from my standpoint, when you talk about what are the challenges, my goodness, uh, it starts all the way from ground zero in Afghanistan to where we're trying to resettle people here in the States. Um, you know, lack of policy, what policy is there that changes all the time for uh, the status of the personnel that are, that are still in Afghanistan, what they're doing to try to resettle folks and how they're trying to resettle an overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed system here in the States. Uh, I could talk for another hour or more on those challenges that we're seeing right now here in the US. And, and right now, just trying to keep people alive inside of Afghanistan. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of mental anguish, mental health issues, both from the people that are, uh, both from our Afghan brothers and sisters that are in country to the folks that are actually trying to work on this problem uh, day to day and uh, trying to look out for each other and then trying to keep them, trying to keep our Afghan partners motivated and keep their spirits up when everything looks so bleak and dark uh, over there. I would just like to see some clear policies and some clear leadership so everybody understood and the goalposts wouldn't continue to move for the different categories of Afghans that we're trying to get out uh, and the other NGOs that are trying to get out would be the one biggest thing that would be a nice start and then also a means and a method to help keep the Afghans that are in, in country alive and safe uh, from the Taliban, which probably doesn't mean recognizing the Taliban as they currently stand as a legitimate government. Travis, I'll let you jump in too, buddy. Uh, you know, there's tons of tons of challenges we're dealing with right now. Thanks, brother. Um, yeah, there is uh, everything that General Hicks just mentioned and then add on about another thousand um, doors that are locked behind that, that we're trying to open. Um, whether that be policy on the Hill or whether that be just being able to feed people daily. Um, I was asked the question, I was proposed a question a couple of weeks ago of, we can't play God and we can't choose who goes, but I got to play God in August and I'm still playing God decided on who's going to eat, who's going to live, who's going to move. That's not a decision I should have to make. That's a, that's a decision on policy. Um, but at least we as, you know, organizations took a step forward and we're still moving forward on those decisions versus um, not doing anything at all. I have every one of my Anasov guys is a P1, but I'm never going to be able to move them under this current situation it's not going to happen so do we continue to feed house and sustain life whether it's like general hicks said the moral aspect of it because they can't keep doing this 
or is somebody going to step in with a structured program to be able to feed everyone and come up with a plan to evacuate the ones, not evacuate, but immigrate the ones um, that deserve to be in the United States or into another country. They fought for us for 20 years. Um, I'm living proof of it, that they are. And they deserve every bit of the American dream that anybody in here does. So um, trying to keep them motivated on that and say, yes, we're gonna get you out is a constant reminder every day for them. And they wake up in the morning and go, is today gonna be the day? And another day goes by and now we're nine months past and we're still saying the same things of going, don't give up hope, we're here for you. You know, we do about 10 to $20,000 in food a week just to keep people alive. Um, nowhere else is that sustainable, but we're doing it as private organizations. And the big government organizations give the food to Taliban to be distributed out to whoever, which our guys will never ever be able to get. So utilize us, use our distribution networks, use the guys that have been in the country for 20 years and we can fix the problem. But the problem is we need funding, we need backing, we need stuff in writing to give a little bit of hope um, to our guys and to our organizations. Um, you know, it's not only what Amy said on, you know, giving people value and work. Um, every one of these organizations gave up their lives nine months ago. And I mean, gave up everything. <clears throat> and here we are with not a ounce of responsibility. Um, and it's, it's very disappointing for me. So when I, when I look at what we have in Anasov and I look at what we have with the pilots of the Special Mission Wing and the Afghan Air Force, how much we put into these guys, we sent the best of the best from the US and all coalition forces to train them. And now we just leave them behind. And on top of that, we have at-risk women who are at the top of the list for us. And we're not doing anything. Um, goes back to what um, the threat, not only in that region, but what that threat could be upon us. So how about we motivate the guys that are there and have them rise up to what, what we need and support them and get the government back in Afghanistan the way it's supposed to be within Afghanistan, have them take care of it. Um, it's a people's choice and we can do it, but they need support. We're doing it all around the world. We can do it there too. Um, and I'll pass it over. Andy. Well, speaking of giving hope, um, uh, Ellie, <laughs> you know, in the last month, uh, as Ambassador Curry mentioned, we've seen this, this march, uh, you know, this oppression of women, this march against women um, by the Taliban with education, uh, how they can dress in public, segregated parks, uh, what can air on TV, travel, and yet you're working with women on the ground to create sustainable pathways. Um, and, and I know that that's what IEW does as well. What, what is needed to kind of crack that code and, and get, you know, get that hope back where people feel like they have control over their lives again? Yeah, um, well, there's there's two discussions here. One is evacuations and you know resettlement, and one is the people that we won't be able to evacuate. The truth is, we won't be able to evacuate everyone. So, how do you identify who's truly at risk? You know, like these women, for example, who are female-headed households, who were um, the female breadwinners. They were journalists. They are no longer able to work. You know, these are, uh, how would they continue their livelihoods in Afghanistan? So we're really honing in on that. And I have to say, I'm also very disappointed um, and I'm, I'm very sorry for what has happened to Ukraine and Ukrainian people. It's absolutely horrific and devastating. But I also have noticed a huge abandonment on um, Afghanistan and Afghan related evacuation, everything cases for Ukraine. And I'm just, you know, it's quite disappointing to see um, all the pathways close pretty much for Afghan people while they really open up 
for Ukrainian. Again, I'm, you know, my I'm very sorry for what's happening in Ukraine, but I'm I'm also very sorry for what's happening to Afghan people. And um, so, in 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 the evacuation, I hope that we could push for more third, like lily pad countries, more flyaway teams to go and assess and expedite cases. Um, allow more uh, broader criteria for at-risk Afghan women, especially. Um, but on the humanitarian side, I would like to continue to push for humanitarian aid, that flow to come into the country for Congress to keep approving the aid budget for Afghanistan, um, for UN to fulfill their pledges, uh, ease of sanctions, um, and also very important with girls and education of finding maybe other unique ways to put pressure on the Taliban, maybe not from the West, but from the Afghan people to put pressure for, for girls to open, for the girls schools to open. Because if we do truly want to alleviate poverty, well, we have to be educated. And half the population of Afghanistan are women. And so that is important factor to keep pushing and keep discussing. Yep, uh, you bring up Ukraine, Ellie, and, and we've seen what US, what the administration can do when it chooses to do it and how quickly they can do it and the disparity between uh, the two countries and, and what we're seeing in um, the refugee programs. Um, we're going to turn over to a couple of questions. I think uh, General Hicks answered one. Um, we have uh, Asila Wardock, who is a former Afghan diplomat. We're honored that she's joined us today in the audience. Um, and, and her question is, we had, to, to Travis's point and General Hicks's point, yeah, the US government trained many of our Afghan pilots, special operations community. We invested in them. They invested in us, many attended schools here in the US. Um, we got news today from Congressman Waltz that you know we're looking at legislation to allow them to enlist in the, the US military. But um, other options for these men and women who did make it here and who might still make it here to join into American society, into a meaningful pathway and career. Yeah, and uh, for, uh, for what we're doing, you know, and I'll give you an idea or to give an idea where, where we're at on resettlement. Um, it's been a huge challenge uh, as far as once, uh, once we started seeing our Afghan brothers and sisters get out of the resettlement camps where they came into the U.S. initially late last year. Um, DHS was putting them into hotel rooms. They, you know, we had one situation where we had a family of 10 in two hotel rooms uh, and literally had the clothes on their back and what they came out of Afghanistan with. Um, no real plan for job training. The, re the big resettlement agencies were overwhelmed with the numbers of people. So they were just putting them, they were stuffing them everywhere around the country, but they weren't putting them in adequate housing. They were putting them in some, uh, many of them are still in hotel rooms right now while we're trying to get them, get them bedded down. Uh, what we're trying to do, you know, as you have the challenges with getting work cards, getting social security numbers, getting all of these little things that we think are normal uh, is very difficult for uh, our Afghan families and, and members. Right now, uh, we've got a great flight school in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we've got three guys that are going through kind of our trial case. And uh, we hopefully have jobs lined up with them with uh, either FedEx or uh, commercial airlines uh, after they get done with their training, which is hopefully going to be within the next month. Once we do that, we've got two more classes of 10 each. Once we get the proof of concept done, lined up to uh, start putting more through ground school and then flying um, and then keep our relationship with some of the commercial airlines up. You know, we just have to do that proof of concept with a small number first to show that we can do it. Uh, in a timely fashion. We're also doing that with maintenance personnel. Uh, it's just a challenge trying to find jobs. And in the current economic environment we're in right now with inflation like it is and housing costs like it is um, to make matters, you know, to make difficult matters even worse, uh, that's just making the money that they do have from the resettlement agencies and the government aid uh, starting out. It's just making it go away that much quicker. Um, 
you know, and we don't frankly have the resources to backfill all of that, uh, given the number of families that we're dealing with. Uh, and one other thing to add is the number of uh, Afghan pilots and personnel that got out of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. The reason they got there to begin with was they evacuated aircraft and helicopters thinking that they would come back into Afghanistan. Well, every single one of them that's made it to the U.S. has their family remaining in Afghanistan, and we somehow have to get them reunified. Um, there is some major mental health issues going on with, uh, I'll say, survivor guilt for the ones that have gotten to the U.S. Uh, that we still have their families over in Afghanistan that we're trying to provide for and keep alive uh, until we can get them reunified, of which there's no real priority or pressing policy on that either uh, right now. So it's just one more thing we're dealing with. Yeah, it's um, we're seeing a lot of um, children separated from parents dealing with, you know, the new cultural issues of just regular adjustment. It's tough to move anyway. And, you know, being evacuated in this manner and then, you know, waking up one day in Virginia or Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> Kathy, what can, one of the questions that we got is, um, you know, working with the State Department um, specifically, you know, kind of what has been the experience, um, you know, the responsiveness. Um, I know you probably can't say much publicly or, or um, but it's, it's, you know, Dave just described this process where there's, you know, no real kind of right and left guidelines, right? It's kind of the learn as you go. Um, but, but you had mentioned earlier to both Ambassador Curry and I that you've had, you um, yeah, you know, the process is working for one of your groups in Rwanda. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and largely due to the U.S. Embassy's assistance there. Uh, prior to that, it was just reaching out, reaching out to to the Oklahoma governor's office, to Oklahoma legislation, and really not getting any tra traction. Could not find you know, resettlement case numbers, couldn't get identification. So the, the U.S. Embassy in Kigali has been helpful in, in, in kind of transitioning a group and in getting them lined up for the processing of their cases. And that's been, been very, very grateful to them for that. Uh, and so one group, I see one group kind of successfully navigating it, but it's certainly not a quick process. It's a slow process. And meanwhile, you've got, you know, that I mentioned earlier, they can't work, uh, can't really are in a state of limbo, really dependent on private citizens helping fund through nonprofit just to, to be able to live and maintain while the, while the case is being processed with, with no definite timeline. There's no, there's no timeline. Uh, my understanding too, uh, that humanitarian parole isn't processing finding out, trying to figure out what to navigate and to file appropriately so that they can can work at some point. So uh, General Hicks mentioned that your resettlement and living and at what point, how long, how many months, how many years will it take to get them into a position where they can support themselves. And that uh, that's around just the social and, um, you know, the, the survivor, the guilt that they have from being separated and and from being you know being fortunate enough to be to evacuate, I think uh, Ellie mentioned the continued education. I think that's critical. I know the Institute of Economic Empowerment of Women plans to extend the program to help women that refugees that are resettling in the United States. So it's it's pivoting and and Travis mentioned it's all of these nonprofits need funding and. I think that's a concern with the focus, just like, oh, they're here, but it's not, they're not here and settled and many are, many are not here. So there's evacuating and then there's those that are still trying to resettle and just get to a point where they can support themselves. So, you know, the application process, um, I put my hands up a little bit, just that I, you know, success is getting a case number, knowing that it's being worked, starting to move through the process and navigate, but it is, it's cumbersome. And most of the Afghans that are trying to doing it, do it are doing it without legal representation. There's a lot of nonprofits 
uh, reaching out to help. That is a, if that's an incredibly challenging process for somebody that that does have legal representation, and a misstep or not filing or declaring uh, wrong could could set them back, could set them back significantly. And there's not there's not a clear place to find that guidance without proper legal immigration le legal representation. So yeah. volunteering, finding those, finding legal aids, I think is critical to helping refu refugees that are trying to resettle do so appropriately so that so that they can work and, and contribute to their communities and their families. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at, you know, just the paperwork and I think all of us are familiar with the, the spreadsheets after spreadsheet of names and cases and everything else. Um, that have been asked to be filled in. And, you know, luckily in, in some cases, you know, lawyers have stepped up. We know the ABA and the IBA have been um, working, you know, thousands of cases. Um, Travis, you know, to, to the point, what, what can listeners do? This is a question from, from our audience. What can Americans do more of? How can they be supportive? Um, of these efforts, we know money is is definitely a need. Food costs are high, and they're getting worse with the the war in in Ukraine and kind of the cascading event of you know grain prices, et cetera. So, you know what what can what can the audience do to help? Right. So, from you know the the U.S. perspective, and we have all these wonderful people that want to help, and I do get the questions daily of you know what can what can we do. Um, as a population, it comes down to support. Um, money is always gonna be a need. I am a horrible person at asking for help, um, but um, organizes, organizations don't run without mm -hmm. funds. And that's just you know the bottom line of it. But the resettlement piece is huge. Um, and you know, Operation Sacred Promise and General Hicks being in with the Moral Compass Federation is a prime example of what we're able to accomplish. Um, with these organizations. Uh, the end state is to bring in a refugee mm -hmm. that can become a prominent individual in the community and eventually pay that back to more refugees, right? So we have all these corporations, multi-billion dollar corporations within the U.S. that have education programs um, that our guys fit into. Um, they know four or five different languages. I know one. Um, they have the ability to learn just as much as anybody else. So let's put them in the programs that are gonna fit their needs the best and get them back out on the streets into the workforce um, where they're prominent people within the society because um, it all comes back. So the question that I have for everybody in the audience is reach out to your Amazons, your Googles, your big corporations that are out there and say, hey, let's get these guys some jobs. That's the fight. That's the hard thing on resettlement. Um, I have guys that have come in and their families, you know, it was the same group um, that General Hicks was able to get out. Their family's still in Afghanistan. And he got called and said, hey, you can now move to Pakistan and get your family out. That's how behind the system is. Um, some guys don't even know what to do with an I-94. They take that and think that's their work ID. It's not their work ID. They need to apply for all that stuff. They need to apply for driver's licenses. Without that information there, it's very difficult for these guys to get jobs. Um, so, you know, as Moral Compass, we want to take them under our wing and give them that opportunity. So to the audience, um, spread the word that that is what we're trying to do. Um, and we can come up with ways to, to put sponsors in and assign them to individuals. Um, I've seen a couple of them here in DC that have worked out fantabulous. It's, I mean, just the best thing ever to see people open their arms and their hearts. Um, but again, nothing runs on water. Um, so the big need and the big ask is always going to be the funding. We're privatization and we're doing a better job than the government. So that's what we need. We need help. I mean, what Moral Compass is doing, you guys are feeding over 25,000 people is amazing um, and keeping them safe and, and clothed. Um, before turning this back to Carrie, I wanna just end with Ellie and, and ask the question a different way. 
what can we do for the, the men, women, and children of Afghanistan? What can the Zonians do? How can we be more supportive? Is it, you know, uh, helping these organizations? Is it more direct support? Ellie? Well, thank you. Thank you for answering, ask, asking that question. Um, I think my biggest ask is always like, don't abandon Afghanistan. Like, please keep the conversation going. I know that there are other international news that take over, but it's seriously the worst humanitarian crisis in the world right now. And whether it's advocacy, whether it's supporting a, a local refugee, whether it's um, fundraising for these organizations in Afghanistan, doesn't have to be uplift, there are plenty more. Please keep that going, please. Um, find that space in your heart to care for Afghan people. Really, they didn't, they don't deserve this, you know? And, um, and I really hope, and we are, Afghan people are extremely resilient people, extremely, but, but we really need to get them out of this mess because it is serious. Um, and yeah, so in, in any way capacity that one can give, uh, whether it's reposting something on Twitter or um, sharing, you know, some uh, emails and forwarding, just do it. Even, even as small as it is, it could make a big impact. So please, that's my ask. Don't forget about Afghanistan. You're absolutely right. They didn't, they did not deserve this. No one deserves this. Um, well, I, I just want to personally thank all of you um, for joining today and turn it back to Carrie. I mean, you guys are, are truly inspiring to all of us as Ambassador Curry said, I know she, she's got her hands on her heart too. I mean, um, you know, we've, we've seen, I think, uh, the best and worst of humanity the last eight months. So thank you for joining us, Carrie. Oh. Thank you very much, Amy. And just as a quick word of, uh, of closing, um, first, I want to thank all of the panelists for joining. Um, I want to thank our audience for listening in. You're really taking the first key step, which is exactly as Ellie said, to make sure that we don't forget those who are in Afghanistan um, who are daily experiencing um, the threats posed by the Taliban. Um, I also want to share a few ideas for additional things that can be done um, first and foremost, I think it's really important when you look at what happened in Afghanistan, the State Department, the White House, they were not postured in order to receive the amount of refugees that were needed to receive. Um, that is why the work was done by everyday citizens like those we've, we've heard from today. So while these are all inspiring stories, they're stories that shouldn't have had to be necessary. This is work that should have been done by the United States government, by other allied governments. Um, so that's one thing to, to keep in mind about making sure that the administration, whether it's a Democratic or Republican administration, is postured and aware of what the national security and humanitarian implications of its decisions are. The second is, of course, following the various legislation that is in Congress, as uh, Congressman Waltz mentioned, um, and making sure that some of that key legislation is passed, including funding for refugee resettlement and other humanitarian needs. Um, third, keeping this in the public eye, it is so important that we continue to message about Afghanistan, that we do not lose sight of those who have been left behind, and that we do everything we can to bring as many of them into safety as we possibly can. Um, and then last but not least, I think one of the most important things that all of us can do is to understand US interests and to prevent pithy rhetoric from putting lives at risk. What we saw over the last few years was a long and concerted campaign by very wealthy individuals trying to say, end the endless wars, stop forever wars, et cetera. And what they didn't realize is that with a small group of about 2,500 American soldiers and others from Europe, we were able to prevent all of the suffering that we've heard about today, every last piece of it, without any combat deaths for 18 months. Um, and you hear from Travis and General Hicks how they are American service members who are very willing to put their lives on the line today to defend their Afghan partners. And I know that's true for a lot of our military as well. And so making sure that we're aware of 
the importance of American principled foreign policy and that we do not make the same mistake in other contexts is critically important. And I think one of the biggest takeaways that we can have. So thank you so much to everyone for joining. Thank you so much to the incredible work being done by everyone on this panel. I'm really in awe to be able to share the, the stage, so to speak with you. Um, thank you so much. And um, please everyone keep Afghanistan in your hearts, in your minds and on your tongue uh, as you communicate with friends, allies, partners uh, and potentially government officials. Thank you very much.